Welcome, everyone. Um, my name is Stephen Henry Madoff. I'm the founding chair of the master's program in curatorial practice here at the School of Visual Arts in New York City. Uh, the program is a two-year master's degree in every aspect of um, training for curating. And as part of the program, um, I am happy to say that each week I get to speak with an interesting, distinguished curator or director from somewhere in the world um, under the title of the Curatorial Roundtable. And this week, I am really happy to have with us Christine Ayane. And I'm just going to read a short bio for her. Um, and it goes like this. Dr. Christine Ayane is an art historian, critic, and curator. She's research curator at Tate Liverpool and senior lecturer in contemporary art at Liverpool John Moores University. Her curatorial practice encompasses contemporary arts with a particular interest in African and diaspora arts, feminism, photography, and sound art. Since 2021, she's been developing independent research on the theme of botanical histories and colonial legacies, connecting ancestral and collective knowledge in an evergreen forest bordering the rural town of Lolodorf in the south province of Cameroon, where she's currently building an art residence, which I hope we'll hear a little bit about today. Ayin Ayane is um, curator of Landskrona Photo Festival 2024's Kunst Hall exhibition. Recent exhibitions include Seeds and Souls, um, Calling and Question, Breaking the Mold, New Signatures from DRC, Resist the 1960s Photography and Visual Legacies, and her writings are published in art books, exhibition catalogs, and art journals. And with that, <clears throat> just a little bit of um, explanation of the session. So Christine will have about 50, five zero, 50 minutes um, in which she'll present. And then there's about 10 minutes and it's relaxed. So it doesn't have to be exactly 10 minutes, but we have around 10 minutes for you to put at the bottom of your screen in the Q and A, which you'll see any comments or questions for Christine. And um, that's it. So um, with that, Welcome, Christine. Thank you. Um, um, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you join in us. Um, thank you for being with us on this uh, curatorial roundtable. Uh, and before I begin, I would like to thank uh, Stephen Henry Madoff for inviting me um, to give this talk and all the tech team at SVA for making this happen. Um, I'm going to talk to you today um, about uh, two exhibitions. Uh, that are part of my feminist curatorial practice. The first one is Where We're At, or the Voices on Gender, which is an exhibition that I curated um, in 2014, so exactly 10 years ago at Beaux-Arts in Brussels. And the second one is Sounds Like Her, Gender, Sound Art and Sonic Cultures, that launched at New Art Exchange in Nottingham in 2017 and closed in, um, it was a touring exhibition that closed in um, uh, at Gallery Oldham in Oldham near Manchester in 2020, a little bit before the COVID uh, pan the lockdowns. Uh, but before I do so, uh, I think it's important just to give you a little bit of background in terms of my intellectual formation and what led me to visual arts. Um, my journey was very much inspired by um, the encounter uh, with South African exile artists who lived in London in the in the 80s. Uh, one of them is Gerard Sekoto, um, who was, who's considered as um, one of the first African uh, modernists um, who depicted black lives in, in South Africa, in, um, in the township, in the ghetto. And uh, I put here a couple of images just for you to have a sort of visual sense of where I'm coming from. Uh, so this image, for instance, the street photographer um, is both an image that speaks to Gerard as, as someone who looked at the black community, but also who's depicting the black community and the sense of agency in terms of self-representation. So here you see people commissioning a street photographer to take their, their, their picture. Um, I also put this self-portrait by Gerard, 
um, who's actually currently at the Venice Biennial. So he's one of in, he's in the section of the modernist artists who were um, overlooked by Western um, sort of um, take on on art history, and this. Another famous work of his, was, um, which is called Song, Song of the Peak, um, also dating uh, 1947, uh, um, before he came to uh, he came to France in uh, in exile. Uh, the other uh, artist who had a huge influence on my on my practice um, is uh, George Hallett, a South African photographer. Um, Sorry, I need to drink already. South African photographer um, who also depicted black life um, in the mid to late 60s in, in South Africa before he went in exile in England, France, and um, Amsterdam. Um, and uh, his practice is very much uh, linked to black representation in a, both in a sort of political sense, but also in, a, in, in terms of black subjectivity. And one of the particular aspects of his practice is that um, for him it was very important to to um, photograph the, the black figure in very in a dignifying way, whether you would be a, you know a street cleaner like in this picture or the future president of um, South Africa after apartheid. Um, and so my research. Um, was as as a student at the time was uh, focused on South African art, but then when I came to England, I encountered the Black Art Movement, and I was uh, really struck by the fact that there were similarities in terms of uh, themes that were being um, um, addressed. So, um, some some of the artists from the Black Art Movement, Keith Piper, for instance, I put a, an example of his work where you see a representation of. Nelson Mandela on the right and uh, Margaret Thatcher on the left, uh, titled Not a Love Story, uh, Tam Joseph's uh, Spirit of the Carnival, which is a work that was um, exhibited at the um, exhibition uh, at Tate Britain as part of a uh, Life Between Islands a couple of years ago uh, that shows an image of, um, of a scene during the Nottingham Carnival where you see the, the police circling a uh, uh, masquerader and this you know these are this is an image from the 80s that speaks to the context at the time in in Britain in London in, in Britain but it's also unfortunately relevant to some of the images that we've seen recently in the news or on social media about police brutality so um, coming to England the black art became um, uh, something that really attracted me in terms of themes and aesthetics and uh, there was a particular moment that I read about in this uh, book, Shades of Black, which at some point became um, became my Bible. So the book by uh, edited by um, David Bailey, uh, Ian Bochum and Sonia Boyce, where they're talking about the first national black art convention um, that took place at, in, in Wolverhampton in 1982. And there's a specific moment that uh, was addressed in a more recent exhibition called The Places Here that took place in uh, uh, 2017 at Nottingham Contemporary, where we could hear uh, the presentation of Claudette Johnson, who was one of the young artists who participated in the, in the, in the convention and presented her work and talked from a perspective of a, a black woman and presented work that uh, dealt with um, black female representation, African aesthetics. And it was decided at some point that she would lead a seminar. And in the seminar, um, she took uh, all the women. And this moment is also depicted by um, Lubaina Himid in her contribution to the to Shades of Black, the, the book. And it's this this um, sort of inspired Lubaina to curate her first exhibition called Five Black Women, featuring Sonia Boyce, Lubaina Himid, Claudette Johnson, Huria Nyati, Veronica Ryan, Claudette Johnson, I must say, who's been recently announced as one of the artists um, nominated for the Turner Prize. So these are some of the works that were in the exhibition. Um, and again, I mean, the reason why I'm talking about this work, their influence on my curatorial practice is that their, their work that um, historical importance is recognized today. And, and they were also in Women in Revolt at Tate Modern. So these are works, for instance, Julian Nyati, that never got the chance to see um, for real. And I was able to see it at Tate, uh, Tate Modern. 
Uh, Lubaina curated two other important exhibitions, Black Women Time Now, um, in 83, 84, 84 at Batter Battersea Art Center and uh, the Thin Black Line at the ICA uh, in 85. And she revisited those exhibitions in a, an, another exhibition called Thin Black Lines um, at Tate Britain that she co-curated with Paul Goodwin. Um, and again, this was an opportunity for me to see some works that I had read about, I'd seen in books, but very rarely we had the opportunity to see those works in, you know, in exhibitions. Um, and here on the right is an image of Lubaina being interviewed as part of the um, images and conversations from uh, the 80s uh, um, video. Uh, and so when these exhibitions took place, I was already uh, in sort of a, what I could call my feminist journey. Um, in uh, 2008, I had a, so I was involved with a journal called Africulture, uh, published in, in French and in France. Um, and I launched an open call um, because I wanted to address the same issues that um, Lubaina and other Black women, Black British women, had were addressing within the context of um, of Black art. So I was interested in the same questions in the field of contemporary African art. And I launched an, a call for contributions, um, and the call was um, entitled. We, is women's cause um, universal? And I was taking, I was drawing from um, a French feminist called Giselle Alimi, which French of North African heritage, Giselle Alimi, whose um, book, uh, um, Women's Cause, uh, led me to interrogate this um, the sort of, uh, yeah, sort of the, the universalism and and um, and the different experiences that we, we would have as black women in, you know, um, as opposed to uh, the experience of uh, of white women, so at the time and or other women, at the time, uh, so I think the this call was uh, was uh, was out and um and I was approached by B C Silva who was a, a feminist curator and she um, was curating I think the second ex exhibition of the the venue that she created in in Lagos uh, C C A Lagos Center for Contemporary Art. Um, and her exhibition was entitled Like a Virgin, and, and um, I think she had identified that I was interested in this topic, and she commissioned me an essay, which I titled Past Virginity, Women, Sexuality, and Art. And the exhibition uh, featured work by Lissue Azibuike and uh, Zanelli Moholi. Um, and so later on, I published a fem um, Feminism in Africa, Feminism, so in plural, in Africa and the Diaspora. Um, and a few years later, uh, L'Aro Femina, so uh, feminine, it's not really feminine art, but uh, it's the, the first issue, Feminisms in Africa and the Diaspora, was sort of more general in scope, but L'Aro Femina was more focused on um, practice, visual art practices uh, by uh, women artists. Um, and so this, um, this issue of um, Africulture uh, was actually actually served as a catalog for an exhibition that I cu uh, curated in 2011 called La Parole aux Femmes or Women Speak Out uh, in Dakar in Senegal and I at the time I curated two exhibitions simultaneously so I went to Dakar to install but I, I was also curating a, an exhibition at a, a South Bank Center called Reflections on the Self uh, five African women photographers. Um, uh, that opened uh, at the same time. There was uh, a touring exhibition uh, that uh, launched in 2011 and toured the UK and, and uh, ended in 2013. So as I was, um, I suppose when I was doing this exhibition, there was I was identified as a curator with interest in black feminism or African uh, feminist art practices. Uh, and I was invited by Boza um, in Brussels um, to propose a project as part of the Summer of Photography, which is a, a photography biennial. Um, and the theme that year was gender relations. Uh, and usually, when uh, Boza have um, when they have a um, uh, when they do the Summer of Photography, they they have like an African exhibition. So they invited me to to propose a project. Um, so I thought about it. I had um, so we had several meetings, and there are three points, a couple of points that I want to address through this exhibition, which was one of my most challenging exhibitions 
exhibition, but um, also one of the, the exhibitions I'm, I'm the most proud, proud of. Um, so one of the points that I wanted to put across was really get um, sort of change the visual percep perception of black women and, and really get our, like our point across. So what I mean by that is that among the artists that I proposed for this exhibition was Angèle Etundi Samba, who's a Cameroonian artist um, who's born in 62 and ha I think has been living in Amsterdam since the 80s. But she's really one of the first African uh, female photographer who's been looking at the black body, that particularly the female body in a way that was beyond, um, even if she was exploring nudity, it was still beyond, um, uh, you know, sort of commodification of, of the body and the exoticization of the black body. And so I proposed her work and the response I got from um, the, the head of exhibition at the time was, oh, this is just a uh, fashion photography. And I said, actually, no, this is not fashion photography. And even if it was fashion photography in the 80s, you would rarely see, you know, uh, black models in the, in the fashion industry. So that was one point that I had to make, which was really to sort of, um, um, I found myself in a situation where I was invited by an institution to do an exhibition, but there was still like some resistance in terms of what I was proposing and the, you know, the discourse um, yeah, that I was putting forth, which was a, which is a discourse um, which is founded on, on artistic practice. So it's not things that I'm inventing, it's things that artists are doing themselves. And also it was important uh, for me to show um, both, you know, the, the relevance of uh, Angel and Tundier Samba, who actually I think is still under, um, on, you know, underappreciated in the art world, but to show her her work from the 80s, still connected with the um, work by young artists at the time. So Ellen J, for instance, is 2010 ongoing. Um, of course, now it's uh, yeah, 2024, but at the time it was uh, very contemporary. Um, and I, I'm, I put these images, for instance, of um, this work called Cheveux de Paille, which is straw hair which deals with the question of black hair, Afro hair, curly hair, and like all the stigma around that and what it means for us as, as, uh, as black women as, and as black people. Um, at the time, I was also very much interested in, um, in um, artistic scenes, uh, sort of marginalized artistic scenes. So uh, from uh, islands from the Indian Ocean, but also Pacific Islands. And in doing my research, I came across Lisa Haley's works, uh, Afrophobia, where she's uh, also addressing, uh, you know, issues around uh, around her Afro hair. And I found that interesting to see that um, we had the same conversations, you know, as Africans in the diaspora, but also in Pacific Islands. So I invited her to be part of the exhibition, uh, as well as uh, Ellen Jay, who was a young artist at the time, um, and who, I'm sorry. <clears throat> Who did this series called uh, "Colored Only," which was quite uh, quite unusual and quite provocative in France, because she would um, um, send uh, uh, open calls for um, studio sessions, and so she would uh, so for people who had like cool hairstyles, and she would only accept black people and reject white people. She was sort of uh, uh, inverting the sort of racism that we experience when we we go into some mainstream uh, places that you know that sort of exclude us. So I wanted to show that in the exhibition, you know, works uh, by artists from the eighties and 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 the relevance of uh, of younger work, younger artists. Uh, at the same time, as I was working on the exhibition, I was also writing an essay on uh, South African artist uh, Mary Sibandi. Um, who's, who does a lot of work around uh, um, African women, female representation in a, in a, in a, her art, um, and I found out about this um, uh, this exhibition where we're at Black women artists in um, uh, 1971. So where we're at was actually a, a collective of uh, African American uh, women artists, and to me that was um, um, a, a sort of grounding. Um, Maybe I, sh I should have mentioned so that the the main exhibition as part of the summer of photography was a, a feminist exhibition that only contained um, a, a white white women artists, 
Um, and so the discourse was that the, you know, feminism was sort of like, there was a sort of Eurocentric view of, um, of feminism, you know, the second wave of feminism in the 70s. And with this element of, you know, having um, a historical um, a record of um, uh, black women artists practicing in the 70s, in, you know, in the States, and demanding so the image on the right, where you see uh, Faith Ringgold and uh, Michelle Wallace as part of uh, the Art Workers Coalition protest outside the Whitney and addressing the the, the underrepresentation of Black women artists, it became um, a way for me to sort of like counterbalance the narrative of the Western feminist and say, look, the, you know, the, there were all there are other forms of feminism, and there the, there was another story that was happening at the same time and you know western feminism is not is not the the only feminist uh, uh, narratives that that's valid so i took that as a as a as an element of my thinking uh, in the exhibition and it became an element of the essay i wrote for the exhibition but because i didn't have access to obviously the american archive uh, which is also done to you know sometimes you're invited to uh, to curate projects uh, there's not necessarily a big budget for you to go do some uh, research for a long period of time. Uh, but I had access to the Making Histories Visible archive because I worked. So that's the archive that Lubaina Hamid created. And um, uh, I worked with her from 2012 to 2022. So it was important for me to add this element in the exhibition. And it became, uh, yeah, it sort of consolidated the grounding of having a sort of a, um, a well, historical legitimacy, but also intellectual legitimacy, and we'll prove it, you know, with the um, uh, archive of uh, exhibitions that were held in the eighties in in Britain and that were kept in uh, uh, in this project developed by Lubaina Hamid. Um, and also to connect with the exhibitions that uh, Lubaina Hamid curated in the 80s, because I see myself as part of this lineage of, uh, you know, feminist practitioners, artists and curators who have paved the, paved the way for, you know, the, the younger practitioners like myself. Um, uh, so in, the, in my exhibition, I had work by uh, Majid Hatari, who's a Moroccan artist, who deals with the uh, so work is called Les Parisiennes, but it, it sort of engages in a dialogue with uh, the work of Horia Nieti, who was, um, I think it was in Lubaina Hamid's exhibition. If not, it certainly is from the, the same period. And Horia herself is uh, sort of challenging the Orientalist um, views of uh, artists such as Eugène Delacroix. And it's something that I continue to explore in a way. Uh, this is work by Fatima Mazmouz, who he's um, who's in um, who was in the exhibition that I'm currently co-curating uh, at Mimosa House in London called Transfeminism. And so she's also addressing the same topic of um, um, sort of like uh, North African women and how and using actually. Uh, erotic postcards from the early 19th centuries. Um, so those colonial postcards were sort of, she's creating a mise en abîme and creating the portraits uh, from that. And then another point I wanted to address was um, the sort of whitewashing of art history and how Anna Mendieta, who was in the other um, exhibition, I, I sort of reclaimed um, Anna Mendieta's uh, sort of practice and thinking uh, and insert, sort of virtually inserted her in my in my exhibition by way of the essay uh, by saying that because um, there was an exhibition when I was working on the, the exhibition at Boza preparing the exhibition there was a um, monographic exhibition at the Hayward Gallery and so I really sort of like discovered a lot of things about our practice um, and uh, I quoted in my essays um, you know, the, uh, the, uh, uh, Anna Mendieta thinking about uh, white feminism and the fact that she identified more with black and brown women, that she identified how deeply ingrained racism was within, within um, white US feminism, uh, and that she she basically um, saw American, fem uh, sorry, American feminism uh, as a white middle class movement. 
And so I had a narrative that I proposed for the exhibition. So in uh, working on this uh, presentation, I, I dug into my archive, so that was interesting. So the initial title for the exhibition, which is uh, now uh, where we at Other Voices on Gender, was initially uh, Voices from the Global South. So that was a working title, but it, it was also because I didn't want the exhibition to be just like an African exhibition because I usually try to, well, I tend to not do just African exhibition, but I create dialogues very much with artists from the global south and because I knew that I wanted uh, to invite artists from uh, um, the Pacific Islands, for instance. Um, and I created, um, so the way I create my exhibition, I, I look at how, um, f first of all, I select work or practices of artists whose practice engage with the theme that I'm, I'm uh, developing, but also I look at how artworks dialogue with each other. So in uh, compiling the different works, I created five sections, so revisiting canons, the mad woman in the attic, the place of blood, silent protest, and eventually love. Um, and some of those um, sections were titled after the title of some of the artist's work, um, and others were more based on the theme of the of those artists. And so, um, another um, point that I want to discuss, which was more like an issue I faced uh, collaborating with Beaux Arts, uh, was that initially. Um, when I, I visited the venue, they showed me the different spaces that they had, um, the nice spaces, and I said, "Oh, I want, you know, I want this space." And then they told me, "Oh no, this is going for the, you know, the other exhibition." And so then they proposed to me a space that was um, in Lower Grand. So Bozar is a really beautiful venue. Very, um, uh, yeah, they have a lot of space. Uh, they do a lot of activities, so um, they proposed to me a space that was sort of disconnected by dis disconnected from the the traffic of the audience. So you know when you go to like you're used to a, um, an exhibition space, you you know for instance that exhibitions are you know I don't know, permanent collection is in one place, temporary exhibitions are in one place, but the visitors are, are used to exper experiencing a, a place. And they gave me a, a space that was in a sort of like lower ground and completely disconnected from the usual traffic of the audience. So I said no, um, which they didn't expect. And um, and so then for eight months, I wasn't sure where my exhibition would be. But for me, it was important. I mean, one of the issues um, I raised with the, the head of exhibition was that in, in giving me this space in a, in a lower ground, it's as if they were giving uh, the white artists the the nice spaces, which you know, walk up the stairs, you go to the left, and you 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 have access to those spaces, and the black artists the basement. And I think in for me in terms of a uh, because I think both in terms of architecture when I when I do ex an exhibition, um, but also basically they were creating a, a sort of like racialist uh, space, so. I said no. It was it was difficult because on the one hand it was like a great opportunity to do a project there, but on the other hand I didn't want the artists uh, to come and and see that you know they would be placed in a in the basement, and so at, at some point they you know they as I stood my ground and like they they gave me some nicer space and and for me it was important for my exhibition to be on the same level as the other exhibition as you entered the 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 the. the um, the, the galleries, the exhibition galleries. Uh, and so I put a floor plan, but you know, we're not really going to see in the details, but it's just to show you the sort of like these conversations that took place um, in making the exhibition. So I, I worked with an exhibition designer called Isabel Speybrook. Um, and so she went ahead and did and placed the, the work based on the, uh, my sort of the instructions I gave I gave her. So there was a back forth. Then I only found that preparing this uh, presentation, I found a, um, another floor plan where I made suggestions and then everything was uh, changed around. 
uh, and then this uh, this floor plan is more or less. You, you, I know you can't see because the images are very tiny, and uh, we don't really have time for me to uh, ex to sort of enlarge them. Uh, but this is more or less the final um, floor plan, um, and I put a couple of. Uh, so yeah, so basically you you went up the the stairs, and for me it was important that my exhibition, which is here, was on the same level as the woman exhibition. Uh, from um, an Austrian collection called the uh, Zamlud Fernund, uh, and they, that was curated by Gabriel Schor. Um, and then the wall text as well, as you arrived, uh, you know, there would be the woman exhibition you carried on straight for the woman exhibition and mine to the right. Um, and I just put a couple of views um, of the exhibition just so that you don't see just like 2D things, but you have a sense of the depth of the, the space. Um, Obviously, there were more rooms, but I, I didn't put um, all the rooms. But here, you know, yeah, you have the little video explaining the exhibition. Um, and I had Angel Etundi Samba, uh, for whom I faced some resistance at the beginning of the of the project. Uh, she was like the first uh, the first photographer that you encountered in the exhibition, and I wrote a text. Uh, my wall text uh, was. Uh, I, I, want, I sort of wanted to provoke the, um, the visitor, also because uh, having been at Beaux-Arts, so usually when I do a project as a guest curator, I try to, to, to be in the place, to be in the venue, and to have a sense of the, of the visitors. Um, there wasn't much diversity at the time. And also, um, when I was working on this exhibition, there were uh, a lot of um, news reports of... Um, the racism experienced by one of our um, ministers in France, Christian Taubira, who's a um, um, French uh, politician of a Caribbean background. And so the first question, the first line of my, um, the, the text that I wrote was, uh, what do you see when you look at a black woman? And then the text continued, but I really wanted to provoke the, the viewer and to get them to think about what they think about um, how they imagine or the sort of, um, the preconceptions or representations they have of black women. And so then there's a, here works works by Zaneli Moholi, uh, Maud Salter, Sotepa Biswas in the, in the video, the same video where Lubaina Hamid was talking, worked by Majida Hatari, um, posters of uh, the exhibitions that uh, Lubaina organized in the eighties and uh, works by Michel Magema and uh, Rema Shashaje. Um, and it's those um, at, at the end, I'm, I'm, I put a link to my website, and there's a photo gallery of these uh, these um, these exhibition this exhibition. So I did the exhibition, uh, you know, had these conversations with the institution, wrote essays that showed that uh, black women, you know, had uh, feminist practice and views and activists, uh, you know, were activists as well. And then the people who do communication at uh, as part of Boza or the Summer of Photography posted this on on their social media uh, by one of the well supposedly a quote by one of the artists who was in the other exhibition uh, Ulrike Rosenbar. So Africa needs a revolution like the one we had forty years ago. African women still have some unfinished business to deal with which I felt was very, um, it's quite patronizing as a, as a statement for a feminist artist and, um, and also quite inconsiderate for Bozar to have posted that when I did this exhibition. And, and uh, so I replied, uh, I was qu quite a bit. Um, so yes, so that, that concludes on the uh, Bozar and I'm sure we can, uh, uh, there will be some questions about the exhibition later. Um, and second the exhibition that I wanted to talk about is Sounds Like Her. But before talking about this exhibition, I, I just want to give again a little bit of a background into my sound art practice because I'm, I'm not a sound art specialist, um, but I, I was invited. So in 2014, when uh, um, Where We At launched in, uh, at Beaux-Arts, I was invited by uh, Vincent Honoré, uh, who sadly passed away in last November, who was director of David Roberts Art Foundation, uh, and he invited me to, uh, as part of the uh, curator series, which is a, a series where they invited independent curator to experiment with their practice, expand their practice. Uh, and at the time I had done 
in my view, many projects um, with women artists. So I wanted, I really wanted to move away from that. So I took a bit of time to myself and and thought, and um, I decided to. I made a proposal, uh, um, looking at something that intrigued me at the time, which was how I I I, um, I hear electronic music and like um, the rhythm in electronic music, like drum and bass, jungle at, at the at the time. Um, and, and and the connection with the um, African uh, rhythmic patterns, and the fact that a lot of time when I was attending sound art events, where sometimes the the uh, sonic matter was very close to African rhythms, but it was only well mostly white people in attendance, and uh, I was trying to make sense of that. So I proposed a project looking at uh, uh, my own. Uh, cultural heritage through music, um, Mikutsi music, which is a, a music from my people in Cameroon, uh, Betty people, uh, which is a very fast um, and quite intense um, rhythm. So I don't have sound, but I'm sure you can Google after the talk and like have a, a sense of what it is. So traditionally, it's, um, it's a music that is played with a balaphone, like an African xylophone, and cool, which is like a um, talking drum, a hololog um, uh, drum and the um, vet, which is the string instrument. Um, and so I grew up with this music, although I, I grew up in France, but um, it's something that was part of our community. So I never thought about it intellectually. But as I was working on the project at um, for David Roberts Art Foundation, I began to do some research on, uh, on Bikutsi music. And of course, I found things that we know as, um, as you know, as um, African people, which is the fact that uh, the missionaries uh, had a, ten a tendency to police our music, uh, you know, expressive lyrics and dance forms, uh, that for them our music was considered obscene, diabolical, and a threat to uh, the Christian values that, you know, that the European colonizers wanted to instill in us. Um, and there's a, I want to quote a, 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 a mention a, a passage of a, a famous book by a famous Cameroonian author called uh, Mongo Betty called uh, The Poor Christ of Bomba, where the French missionary, uh, Father Dumont, Père Dumont, um, in a mad rage, uh, pounced on the xylophones and knocked down the tam-tams of a village that had stubbornly insisted on singing and dancing to their own music on the first Friday of the month. So our music was in a way considered as a as a form of resistance to sort of like the colonial colonial ideology that was being um, imposed on on my uh, grandparents and my parents. Um, I became so that actually became the grounding of the project that uh, I proposed to um, David Roberts Art Foundation, and simultaneously I was looking at sound art history. Um, and uh, from a Western perspective, and I became interested in John Cage and um, the creation of the prepared piano. And I realized that in the West, so when we talk about John Cage or the prepared piano, um, so John Cage is this giant figure, but uh, most of the time in Europe, at least, um, Sibylla Fort, who's the dancer for whom John Cage created this sound piece, uh, when he was still a student, is is overshadowed by by John Cage. So in a way, um, I sort of like um, wanted to platform the the importance of uh, Sibylla Fort as a you know as as a as a dancer as a creator in this exhibition that didn't necessarily um, look at feminism as such. And so what I presented in the in the exhibition, uh, we we uh, got permission from uh, Ayuka Shenzira to present her film, Sivila, They Dance to Her Drum. And in the film, there's a um, dancer, Diane Harvey, who's uh, reenacting the choreography of uh, Bacchanal, uh, which we only know through the through John Cage, the, the, the actual music. And I, in the exhibition, I looked at um, two of the pieces created by John Cage for African-American dancers, uh, Primitive, um, and uh, Our Spring Will Come, uh, dated 1943. And Our Spring Will Come was actually a piece that he created for Pearl Primus, um, who created a choreography based on a poem by Longstead Hughes. So what I wanted to do was both reintroduce the Black narrative in, in um, the those 
prepared piano pieces by uh, John Cage, but also give a platform to uh, to those women. And in the essay that I wrote at the time, I, I mentioned the fact that uh, that um, when uh, Pearl Primus uh, performed uh, her, you know, her her, her piece, um, it was more it was associated to Longston used rather than John Cage, which is different now. Um, I was also interested in uh, the object and how African objects um, sort of uh, encapsulated or embodied sound, vibration, and movement. Um, and so in the essay, I also sort of reflected, I drew from a research by a um, dancer and choreographer called Alphonse Thierroux from Ivory Coast, who um, developed this theory that the quota query that you might have seen if you've considered work by Picasso and Demoiselle d'Avignon, uh, who considered that the, the legs in the, in the quota relic Reliquaries were actually dancing legs, so I found it interesting to put them in, in parallel with the civil effort. Unfortunately, for the exhibition, we couldn't borrow a, a, a put a reliquary. But then, in thinking of that, uh, so after doing the exhibition uh, at David Roberts Art Foundation, I was invited by uh, New Art Exchange to do a chapter two of this exhibition, and um, it became uh, very clear then that after having done so much research and having my, immersed myself in this um, sonic world, sound art world, that women were once again underrepresented. Um, so th that's something that I took on board. And the other thing that I found in like in um, furthering my research to Bikutsi music was that Bikutsi was traditionally um, a female genre. Um, and I drew from uh, um, on research by uh, Cameroonian musicologist uh, Stanislas Awona, who says that uh, uh, Bikutsi was a space for women to share their ideas according to a language known to them only. And Jean-Maurice Noah, who talks about how uh, Bikutsi was born out of a phallocratic society that relegated women to an extremely marginal status, and Betty women, so Betty is um, people, uh, were forced to create a space in which to have a voice, a vengeance consciously uh, exercised by women against men. And so all that uh, was part of my uh, my grounding in, uh, for the exhibition uh, Sounds Like Her. Uh, but I was, at the same time as I was doing my research um, and preparing this exhibition, um, I also I, I was also um, marked by resonances uh, from contemporary society and the black female experiences. Um, so in 2015, when I did uh, the David Robert Hart Foundation, um, the, the Venice Biennial happened. And there was at the time, in the summer in Venice, they hosted uh, the Creative Time Summit. Uh, and at the time, uh, Simone Lee was one of the artists uh, who had a creative time residence. She made a presentation, a very moving presentation, where she talked about uh, Esmin Green, um, a woman who died uh, in 2008, a story that I didn't know, uh, who died in a hospital in Brooklyn. Uh, I think she waited for at nearly 24 hours and she, and it took uh, more than, uh, like nearly one hour or more than an hour for staff to check on her um, and all the events that were really marking at the time, the, the situation, the uh, McKinley pool, pool party that was where a uh, policeman uh, you know, basically sat on a, a, a young girl who was, was 14 and in a swimming, swimming costume. Um, the case that marked me the most was uh, Sandra Bland uh, who died in police custody and who was brutalized uh, by the police um, just because she didn't signal when she changed lane. So these were some of the images that really, I think for a lot of us as black people, but also as black women was re really um, uh, striking. And even if you're not, for, for me who's based here in the UK and not in the States, it's still something that you you relate to and you know you feel really strongly about. So it got me to think about uh, black female voices and silencing, and to think of Audre Lorde's uh, um, uh, statement, your silence will not protect you, but also to think of how silence can kill you, uh, on being killed for being vocal, 
on the brutality still experienced by black uh, female and queer bodies. Um, so, you know, in any way, in, in um, like any situation, you, you obviously you need to speak out, but, um, you know, viol violence can still occur. So that's something that was really at the back of my mind when I, uh, when I was preparing the exhibition. And the element of my um, curatorial practice and the way I research is also to engage with the um, with platforms, uh, with context, with you know, with other professionals or other practitioners who are also interested in the same questions. And in 2016, I was invited to give a keynote speech as part of uh, the um, symposium uh, Feminism, Activism, uh, Feminism, Sound Art, Activism. Uh, gender sound art activism uh, organized by the Center for Research into Sound Art Practice. And, and I gave a, a lecture that was also part of my research process for the exhibition. And at the time I contacted Simone, Simone Lee and uh, told her about the, these projects that I was doing. Uh, I couldn't include Simone in the in the exhibition, but um, she she shared with me images of the project that she did as part of the creative time um, residence and the uh, uh, project that she did at the new museum, uh, sort of collective project called Black Women Artists for Black Lives Matter. So I presented those images and also um, some of the audio that she shared of uh, women singing. And you can see also some of the instruments that are close to, you know, uh, sort of Black vernacular culture. Um, and so all that from part of the, sorry, <clears throat> from part of the, the, the research behind uh, sounds like her, um, and so two of the, um, I would say two of the uh, original sides of uh, or stances of my project were both considering sound art beyond the electronics. Because a lot of time when I was attending like sound art event, it was very much about, uh, you know, obviously who can afford the the, the latest technology, um, and so my argument was, uh, well, that you know there were other uh, forms of sonic practices, so that's why I titled the exhibition. Um, I mean, one of the the subtitles is sonic culture, so I'm referring to um, different kind of like sonic cultures that exist and that are not well at the time were not necessarily taken into account when talking about sound art. Um, and I was also thinking about how do you engage, um, how do you uh, engage with sound from a non-sonic perspective? Also thinking in terms of audiences that, you know, that were uh, hearing impaired and how do you, you know, how do you engage with uh, those audiences? And very much um, what I was trying to do as well is uh, um, sort of complexify or, or address or give a platform to women or feminist art practices beyond uh, representation, because I had done so many photography projects uh, and beyond the commodification of, uh, of the female body. So sound was a, a, a way to sort of go beyond that. Um, so in the works that were part of the exhibition, uh, so the exhibition, of, that's, that's the first room uh, at New Art Exchange with an installation by Sonia Boyce, um, uh, called uh, de the devotional series that she started in 99. At the time, it was still present. I'm not sure whether she's continuing with, the, with this series, but it's a series that contains, um, that explore uh, the history of Black British female performers. So some of them erased from history and, and she's sort of uh, reinscribing those uh, performance, uh, perform performers within the um, community, um, by doing those workshops with the community, but also using um, her archive of posters and articles and um, and, and tickets of uh, uh, yeah of those uh, uh, performers. Uh, so the exhibition is the wallpaper and the overlaid uh, placards. Um, again, in the same way, I had a, a sort of a, a room that was the backstory of the project that. Um, uh, at Beaux Arts in Brussels with the archive, I had the backstory of uh, the exhibition in the mezzanine at, at New Art Exchange, which is to me the the story that's sort of a uh, yeah is behind the the thinking of uh, of an exhibition. So with the the balafon, 
that we had and um, works by um, uh, again yeah so um, the balafon and the cool and other instruments and actually visitors were encouraged to to play music because uh, it's also I also want to do projects where people feel that they can touch things and you know and, and it can be playful um, I, I at the time I um, connected with a young Cameroonian artist called Madeleine Bida, uh, who was also exploring Bikutsi music, but through painting, and so those paintings are uh, show the the, the movements, uh, the dance movements, um, uh, and they have a sort of similarity with the work by um, Sonia Boyce, with the the names that are circled, and the the circle sort of uh, emulate the sound wave. Uh, just for uh, just to give you a, a, a sense of uh, the the movements in question, I, I have a video. You won't hear the sound, but you'll have a sense of a uh, of the of the movements in question. So I'm sure if you go online, you'll find other examples of Bikutsi dance. Uh, and another thing that Madeleine did was um, um, experiment with the the rhythmic patterns and and um, replicate them in in terms of uh, uh, color schemes. And, and she did like a chromatic experiment on the six eighth uh, rhythmic pattern, and which she gave me a long explanation that I will not repeat here. But that was interesting to see how she went from this traditional dance to uh, this kind of paintings. Um, another uh, view from uh, the exhibition at York Art Gallery uh, and some of the other artists who were uh, presented in the exhibition. So Ayn Bailey with a sound piece, uh, an immersive sound piece, uh, Magda Stawarka, uh, Mother Tongue, where she recorded um, the first cry of her baby when she gave birth. That's dedication for, from a, a sound artist. Um, and then the other, the series of work looked at uh, his uh, speech development, uh, Linda O'Keefe, who looked at um, the sonic impact of uh, windmills, um, Christine Sun Kim, who's an American uh, deaf artist who's considering sound both through uh, the sonic element, but also through visual, and Magda Stawarka, again, uh, transliteration, which was a series on um, uh, the fact of uh, being from one country, or thinking in one language, Polish, and uh, being in another language, um, English. Uh, so all that is in um, two books that uh, we published for the exhibition, uh, where we had other voices on gender and sounds like her. Um, I put my uh, website... Oh, yeah, so this is part of, like... A, that there's more exhibitions to come. The next one is opening in a couple of weeks at Mimosa House, and all this is uh, on the on my website. Uh, or if you Google my name, you'll see my website. And if you look at um, at uh, past exhibitions and you scroll down, you'll find images of uh, uh, sounds like her and um, uh, where we're at uh, with the photo galleries, uh, and also links to the to the books. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Um, so now is the time for questions and comments. And um, for starters, we have two. Um, first from F.L. Wilson. Um, can you note the name of the essay you, you were talking about relating to John Cage? Um, uh, um, yeah, so it's an essay by Tamara Levitz. Uh, the, okay, the name, I'm forgetting the name now. Uh, Can you um, type the name of the author in the chat for everyone? Yeah. Okay, um, next is a remark from Laura Ganda. I observe a lot of power dynamics in your work, i.e. at Bazaar. How can curators navigate power dynamics when collaborating with institutions or artists, i.e. male artists, that you worked with in South Africa to ensure an equitable partnership, reciprocity to actively get support for Black feminist curation in the diaspora. Thank you. Um, I think this, there are two elements in the question. So the first one of the institutions, I, I think, um, I would say, so when I did uh, where we at, 
I would so it was ten years ago. I would say that then I was a young curator, a sort of emerging curator. Um, and at the time, what was important to me was uh, first of all the support of the artist. Uh, for instance, in my decision not to uh, accept the lower ground, I spoke to one of the artists, Angel Etundi Samba, and and just to share. And also, I spoke to Lubaina. Uh, so it's important to have the support of the artist so that you, because you're curating, but, you know, it's a very much of a, a as I think for me, exhibitions are dialogues with artists. So, you know, you you have a collective voice, uh, but also about knowing, knowing what you're talking about and being passionate about uh, what you, you know, the, the subject that you're um, developing in your, in your exhibition. And, what I mean by that is, for instance, I, I didn't do feminist project because it was a trend. For me, it was something that was vital. Um, it's both connected to what we experience in society and, and art and institutions are part of society. And um, yeah, I think you, know, you one needs a, it was quite nerve wracking um, and you need determination, I guess. And then I would say, I think there was an element in the question about um, uh, um, curators from black curators from the diaspora or something like that. I think it's a uh, us in conversation. Uh, I I always encourage. So I, I teach um, at university. I always encourage, uh, and even when I do um, portfolio reviews, when I go back to Cameroon, I always encourage um, artists, young people, or, or yeah, people in the scene to go to other. Other, you know your peers' exhibitions and and be in conversation, be a community. Um, when I was working with Lubaina, what we tried to do was really um, to create platforms where, either when she was doing an exhibition, we would invite. Um, well, she was she was always she always wanted to have uh, people from the community to be invited or to be part of her, the public program of her exhibitions. Um, yeah, so as I would say, you know. Be in dialogue with uh, uh, with other curators, other black or African curators. Um, I know that sometimes it's not easy if we if we're busy on on our projects, but I personally try as much as possible to 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 go so in the, to be in, on the continent and to exchange with uh, with other younger curators. I hope uh, that, okay. that answers the question. Um, so could you? Um... Go back one slide to show your website again, because people are asking for the. Uh, okay, the sorry, I did something. Ah, uh, I, I stopped sharing. <laughs> I will share again. Great. So that is the website. Um, all right. So there's a couple of other questions. Um, Emily, who I guess you work with, Emily Bestwick says, hiya, Christine, it's Emily from Tate Liverpool. Thank you so much for a fantastic presentation. I found your discussion of multiple genealogies of feminism fascinating. This also links to multilingual feminisms, question mark. I wondered if you could talk a bit more about how your practice operates multilingually and maybe through translation too, question mark. Um... So I would say as, as someone who's a, a French speaker, um, what I encountered when I came to England was um, access to uh, scholarship and like, uh, you know, testimony and experiences of uh, um, Black feminists from the English speaking realm. Uh, to which it doesn't seem like that, but to which we didn't have access in, um, in France, for instance. So when I came to England, I had access to, you know, I found out about post-colonial studies, cultural studies, Stuart Hall, uh, you know, um, I don't know, Angela Davis, um, Audrey Lord. Um, yeah, uh, I, I can name may, may, many of them. Um, so that's, that's one thing on the one hand uh, in the West uh, about how, I mean, now these texts are being translated, but... Uh, when I started as a curator, uh, and you know, when I came, when I moved to England, it, that's it, for me it was a, a real discovery. So it was interesting to see, uh, and also it was a way for me to be able to connect 
intellectually with discourses um, by um, African Amer American thinkers. Um, you know, I think in France we had like a vague idea of like the black. I mean, we have yeah, we had a, a sense of the black experience in the states, but it's more mediated by you know th through music and like hip hop um, and and films. But being able to to read and like to actually what um, having access or reading in English had helped me sort of uh, uh, intellectually formulate a lot of things that I had uh, that I sort of like experienced and expressed sort of intuitively. But when I had uh, access to all this scholarship and like all these experiences, um, you know, yeah, that's that was something that was helpful. But then uh, I'm, I'm also someone from Cameroon. Uh, unfortunately, I'm not that proficient in my mom's language, which is uh, Ewondo. But I'm, I also know that uh, there are other... I'm, I'm interested in other forms of thinkings beyond the Western model. So I think that's something uh, that I'm exploring in, um, in through another project uh, that Stephen mentioned at the beginning with my residency in Cameroon. Um, but yeah, that's in in terms of my own practice. I've um, it's either um, providing a platform for artists to explore, you know, the, those feminist, um, uh, you know, f their feminist thinkings in their in their own language. Um, but yeah, so I I don't know. It's difficult. I don't know if I answered the question, but uh, that that's my my answer. Okay, um, <clears throat> two more um, questions or comments. So um, someone who is anonymous writes, you spoke about the white American middle class feminism. Do you think they are now actively listening to you and Black African artists? And do you think they are willing to give space in their narratives to your critique um, of their in effect, elitist, elitisms. Well, oh, okay, I was meant, I was uh, quoting Anna Mendieta, but um, I think now with the the idea of um, intersectionality, I think there's a better uh, sort of willingness to to share space in theory, but I think that what I still see. Um, Spaces where uh, there is there are still remaining forms of um, what I call implicit implicit bias, or sometimes things that um, you know some uh, uh, yeah I would say white feminists or even in the art curators or um, I'm not going to talk so much about artists, but uh, there are still um, instances where. I still feel that I need to speak out about certain situations, so I'm not going to be specific, but I still think that even though there is, uh, there are curators who are talking about uh, intersectionality, that doesn't necessarily mean that they, uh, I mean, I think they are open to sharing space, but I also think that no one has a sense of everybody's experiences, and it's still important to, uh, uh, yeah, to sort of raise certain uh, you know, implicit biases that sometimes can be involuntary, but if we don't speak out, if we don't say, okay, this actually is an issue, you know, uh, things will not happen. So I'm happy the, with the fact that we are, there are conversations. So at the moment, for instance, I'm co-creating this exhibition, Trans Feminisms, and I'm uh, I'm speaking from my own perspective. We, each of the, we're four curators, uh, Maura Riley, Jennifer McCabe uh, and Daria Khan. So Maura and Jennifer based in the US, uh, Daria and myself based in, um, in the UK. Uh, but there are times where, you know, we can be in conversation and I can say, I think this term, you know, might be problematic or, uh, you know, or, or I can sort of, uh, there, there's there's enough room for conversation in, in you know, to, yeah, in case, in instances where I raise an issue on, either words or thinking of a, a, along in this collective project. Okay, and last, <clears throat> you've discussed discrimination experienced as a curator. How do you keep your friends and then CIE? 
maybe it means IE, I'm not sure, and not be distracted and disheartened by these experiences. Thank you for the work you do. Uh, thank you. Um, so so uh, I heard, how do you keep your friends and your... And not be distracted and disheartened by, you know, these discriminatory experiences. Yeah, uh, I, to be honest, it's really hard. Um, it's really hard, but I, I'm, um, I think we're a community in a way. Um, and it's always good to have people uh, with whom you're able to 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 speak to. Uh, yeah, that's <laughs> it's a re it's really a question that touches me because um, it, yeah, I still think that we we encounter when when I was working with Lubena, you know, at, at someone to whom I, I could speak, and uh, we don't work together anymore. But uh, I'll see her in a couple of weeks and uh, be able to share with her. But um, yeah, I think. Really thinking in terms of uh, of community and also keep on fighting because if we you know if we if we complacent which is also why I um, I tend not to just focus on African project but I also want to work on uh, with artists um, who speak from um, different places of marginalization because I think we also a lot of us are in it together. Um, uh, and one of the artists who's been nominated for the Turner Prize as well, Delaine Lebas, who's a British artist of Romani heritage, is also an artist that's been uh, co collaborating for many years. Um, and so, yeah, I think uh, thinking in terms of community and 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 talking to each other, and and I think speaking out. And I know that sometimes it's hard because sometimes you think, oh, if I say something, I'm, I might lose this project or I might be blacklisted. But it's happened to me a couple of times, and I'm, um, you know, I'm still doing projects with uh, people who are interested in working with me. Okay, so I think so. And that, by the way, who wrote that said um, she meant how do you keep your positivity? But I think you answered that. So great. So thank you so much. This has been wonderful, and um, thanks to the audience. This is the last roundtable for the season. <clears throat> so it was wonderful to do it, I have to say, with Christine. And um, Christine, so I'm going to join you in a minute on the other link with the students. Thank you, All everyone. Right. Thanks, Bye. everyone. Bye.